Microphone check, microphone check, one, two. This is Behind the Rhyme, Hip Hop 101, a masterclass. Today, bass, how low can you go? Death Row, what a brother know. Once again, back is the incredible, rhyme animal, the uncannibal D, public enemy number one. Five O said freeze, and I got numb. You can stop it right there. Relevant in 1987, relevant today. Chuck D, today on Behind the Rhyme. My brother from another mother, <laughs> Chuck D, Public Enemy. What's up, bro? You are the sensei, MT, master teacher. Now okay. you got me on your hot seat. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> on the electric chair. Not at all, not at all, not at all. Real easy, real laid back. Uh, in general, man, just start. Tell us where you, where you come from, where you started. Started from uh, Roosevelt, Long Island. Uh, I wanted to be a sportscaster. Uh, the whole thing about hip hop in the mid 70s is what bit me because it was a whole um, atmospheric party changing event. I started going to parties at 16 and that's what was starting to happen. So um, it coming out of the Bronx and uptown Manhattan, Harlem, by way of people like yourself, um, traveling to Long Island was just a train ride, a car ride and a, and a cousin phone call and heartbeat of borrowing their stuff for it to be out there. So uh, it took on and by 1978 and 79, I tossed around a few rhymes just to uh, stay at the parties and, and keep whack MCs off the <laughs> mic. That's how I got started, Mo. I didn't want to actually be an MC, but I, I was a fan of, of, of such greats like a Hollywood or Starsky or whatever, or Eddie Chiba and, and Melly Mel and guys like that where the tapes had gotten around. So obviously when people thought that the microphone was open and songs like Good Times and Love is a Message was being played by the DJ, everybody just thought just because they from Absolutely. New York, they could rhyme. Absolutely. I'm like, y'all messing up my dance with some <laughs> girl. You know how hard it is to negotiate to some fly girl who's sitting on the sideline at a party. Finally, you, you get up the nerve, you want to dance and, and you could get on the, on the floor or whatever. But if the, if the DJ or the MC is terrible, after a while she look at you like, I don't really, I don't know what they doing. I don't feel like dancing no more. So <laughs> at college I got on the microphone and on a line of 10, especially in 1979, it was 10 people lining up to get on the mic because they automatically thought that they was gonna spit because they was from New York and it happened to like kind of be in, in the water that, okay, I grew up in off of Gun Hill Road, so automatically I go to school at Delphi and I'm out here with these country bumpers. And so the minute that they played this Love is a Message of Good Times, I'm gonna go in there and do like my neighborhood does. And it's like, it doesn't happen that easy. So I used to be like, look, I'm gonna get on that line. And after I got on that line to rhyme, the people behind me sat their ass down and went to dance. <laughs> that was my goal and my purpose is to eliminate <laughs> whack MCs from getting the open mic and it worked. And that's where Hank Shockley saw me because we're from the same right. town. And um, I first came to him wanting to do graphics because I was just a fan of the event. I didn't want to be part of the event. But he said uh, uh, I had a voice that would actually, uh, it would it would actually match what they were doing musically and that's how we became Spectrum City out of Spectrum and um, that worked, you know? I mean, I, I had to give it a thought because I want, you know, I wanted to right. go to the parties, man. I didn't want to be the person playing the music, so. Yeah, when did you think uh, that it actually had a chance to become a career? Weird story, you know? At 79, I'm 19 years old. I got my ass kicked out of college. I was fantastic, I was a phenom in graphics and art and design. But uh, I got kicked out for not just not being focused, going to too many parties and not going to class. <laughs> I went to school every day. Adelphi University is four, four miles from my crib, from Roosevelt. I went to school every day, didn't go to class. I mean, you know, the, the freshman excitement of, oh, wow, you know, not taking it <laughs> seriously. But I was good. I was damn good. I was a school cartoonist. Mm. So ironically, where, when I was out of school for that uh, year and a half, and that's a whole nother story. Um, I had heard King Tim the Third. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, okay. They, wow, this is something. The Fatback Band, 
you know, we play in the Fatback Band as the Fatback Band, but they got like an MC with them. And then when Sugar Hill came out, it was basically like good times with the way we, that we were more familiar. Right. Maybe it wasn't, it wasn't my heroes, it wasn't Grandmaster Flash and, and the Furious Four uh, uh, at the time, right. but it was like, whoa, okay, wow. The thing that made me think it was real, their records, right? Mm -hmm. I can go to and work in the art department because I was a big fan of album covers and stuff like that. So I said, I got a reason to go back to school because this thing is real. That was the weird thing about it. Wow. I, not to come in as an MC. I said, this thing is real because if they make a records, I could be a they need jackets, <laughs> they need all this. I'm a graphics guy and that's, that's what made me think it was real. Uh, so I'm gonna move forward to 1987. Oh shit. Uh, <laughs> well, really 86 before 87. Before before Kubo D's report card. <laughs> <laughs> In 1986, the big groups, the big groups at the time, were Run DMC, uh, LL Cool J, Houdini, Fat Boys, and it was this wave of what we were calling new school because we come from what I considered old school at the time. And I never forget being on tour, was on the, on the Dope Jam tour, Def Jam tour before mm -hmm. Dope Jam or whatever. And uh, ironically, I was opening one of the opening acts. And the first time I ever heard a Public Enemy thing, we didn't know who they were, and we heard this real, real big voice. Uh, for me, my thing was Time Bomb. You go, ooh and ah, when I jump out the car, people treat me like a Reem Abdul Jabbar. And I remember being hooked on the, the, the sonics, the sound, the vibration, the whole thing or whatever. And I was like, so who, who are they? Because we didn't know what it was. And again, they were going against type in terms of what kinds of records were being made at the time. Uh, the pro-black content, uh, my Uzi weighs a ton, uh, my 98, and then it was this other little voice. Yeah, boy! And it was like back and forth with each other. So we didn't know, and uh, in all honesty, we didn't know if it was gonna work, if it was gonna last, we didn't know what to make of it. And I finally get out, I go on tour, I get off the bus, and I walk over and I'm like, so where's Chuck? And I'm expecting it, because his voice is so big, I'm expecting Shaq, <laughs> it's Chuck D. I shake hands, tell him I love his stuff or whatever, and then I find out he has this wealth of information. The group is on tour, and they were opening again, because we, we finally opened together. He opened first and I got on or whatever, and I remember the audience. The audience was not receptive at the very beginning. Uh, it, it wasn't booed, but it was kind of like, Let's get to LL. What are y'all doing? Like, it, it really wasn't <laughs> really hot. Columbus, Georgia was their first date. That's crazy. Yes, yeah. yes, Columbus exactly. Yeah. Yes. And uh, midsummer, I never forget this. Uh, we're, we're still traveling, doing our thing or whatever. You do the Less Than Zero soundtrack. Right. And Bring the Noise comes out. And mm -hmm. it was like a paradigm shift on tour. Yeah. They went from the opening act that was kind of getting booed mm -hmm. to the, we need more of these guys. Mm -hmm. For you, from the transition, what was the, what was the, the, the feel going from, because I know you felt it when you were there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going from that level of, of, of non-acceptance to almost domination, complete domination? It was a domination. I remember that first day, you know, I met you at, at uh, Columbus, Georgia. Of course, everybody who meets Mo D was like, wow, you know, how, so everybody had to watch their step. Modi already had out the, the report card. <laughs> I was just enamored while people were like, oh, I get this, and I said that we, we got a B minus. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I was just like, that gave me so, cause I was just surprised that we were on the list. Wow. And, I, and just the fact that being on the report card gave us energy that you wouldn't believe. Cause we know there was a lot of people that we, now we saw a list. Now we could start picking off people on the list now, but, um, because we had something to strive for and look for. I mean, I, th I believe that greatness comes from competition and also there should be a pecking teaching order and there should be a hierarchy where you learn from the best. So um, coincidentally, at that time during the Jeff Jam tour, we had performed our transitional record, which is our first record that really hit the streets and that's Rebel Without a Pause. And we had performed it across America in May, June, July, and August, the faces that looked at us like this. Yeah, bring on LL and Houdini and Dougie Fresh and Eric B and Rock'em. We want to see them. Rock'em. Rock'em, <laughs> right? 
Because they couldn't say Rakim for some reason in Augusta. <laughs> it's a, it's, especially the older DJs right. who used to say Glass Night and the Pimps, and you better not say Pimps. So, you know, so they didn't know how to say Eric B and Rakim. But with these people playing with us, our transitional record was Rebel Without a Pause. And everything has to come from a seed. So as that seed, you know, grew, and traveled slowly because back then I think you know better than anything is like your reception is usually was was an echo mm -hmm. if you hit with something in June in New York it would probably be a hit in Kansas City in January because everything wasn't connected right back then it wasn't networked back then especially in rap music and hip-hop it was region and then they had to take another region and then take another region and the only commonality that we had was Soul Train that was the only time we got national. Right. Once right. you hit Soul Train, and everybody lit up at the same time. So we, our transition was Rebel Out of Pause, the Northeast spread in sections. And then we did bring the noise, which was a second layer, but we really didn't become a national story until Rebel Out of Pause on Soul Train, which aired in December. 1987. That's when everybody like, oh, I saw them. Yeah, I know these guys. Yeah, they got this going on. And then black folks got like that and everybody else that followed rap that would find rap music, the place that would play it. Because BET didn't exist or playing it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and MTV damn sure was saying no, you know, to, to mostly 99% of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So Don Cornelius and Soul Train made it happen to our base. And content and name. Why did you choose the name Public Enemy and the content in particular? Because it was definitely against the grain of what we were doing at the time. We're old, I was old, Hank was old, we're older. So we come, we remember the 60s. We come from the 60s. I was in the Panther lunch program at my grandmother's house, 151st Street between Broadway and Amsterdam, and I remember when the trucks used to come by and give you the lunches, and oh, Black Panther program, oh, why are they giving us this? Because they just do it, you know? And I was 69. So we remember the 60s. I remember when Dr. King was assassinated, so I don't have to go look on Wikipedia and Google or backlog. I mean, I, you know, the, the New York City teachers were on strike. I was in third grade. They, 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 I remember not even going to school half that year. And then all of a sudden, Dr. King gets assassinated, and, every, and everybody around the country is like, "Well, don't send your kids to school. Don't go. Don't go to work today because it's going to be riots in New York. It's going to be riots all, everywhere." So, I remember these things. So, with all of us getting together to to talk about what who ain't talking about something was rather easy, you know. Right. So, and, and and we knew that once again, radio was our basis. That your differences are going to be your assets you mm. know you know mm. it's like mm. it's like boxing and it's like you got this counter that that's gonna like boom boom oh wow i didn't see that coming and yeah it might not be the punch that's going to be the initial knockout but eventually it's going to be the difficult you know right. uh, thing to get around in, in a contest going from less than zero 87 88 1989 well actually in 87 you start off with the def jam tour with the the, the the sirens and all the stuff from overseas, which let us know you were overseas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had to make sure that we let people know that y'all ain't got to follow us in the United States. We already got the rest of the world following us, and we're trained from the best, such as Mo D. They, if, you know, once you said we are right, we don't worry about anybody else. <laughs> okay. We can't, we have it. one fan. We're like, you know what? The, the whole thing of being in it and knowing that the best kind of anoint you and give you the fuel and the passion to, to knock everybody out, that was enough. And then I wasn't, you know, there's certain things that, that you have to play to your strength and also recognize your weaknesses. I'm not saying I'm shy, but I'm not really one to be having, you know, okay, I'm the guy, I don't have those abilities. I don't have the, the ability to memorize well. Wow. I can write well, and I have to kind of go over it, like over and over. So I like to trade off of, off a situation. So. You have to recognize your ability. And then, you know, um, and two guys like, you know, LL Cool J comes along and then later on you come out with your solo album. It wasn't a nice <laughs> terrain for soloists. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that was a hard thing to do in the 80s. Everything was built off of groups, you know. Right. You come out of the group concept, and then, you know, when you came out and actually came out in a soul situation, I was almost like, wow, okay, yeah, Moe's like the greatest, but how's this going to work, you know? So it wasn't easy, right. but I knew right. I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew damn sure I couldn't do it. So uh, the public enemy is built around a, a bunch of different things. Sonically, I like to be heard. I don't like to be seen. But being alongside a dude who really likes to be heard and loves to be seen, it was a perfect thing to build a group around. And then also with Flavor and, like I said, Flavor Terminator X, Professor Griff, we put together something that, that worked with the numbers of people, but just in different roles. Everybody wasn't an MC. It was really he's the MC and he's the DJ, and then these things wrapped around it in a different way. And that worked for us. And I did a demo called Public Enemy Number no. One when somebody tried to come at me in 1984. And so I made a demo called Public Enemy Number no. One because I was Public Enemy. I, I had been MCing on the radio for a while and I had stopped rapping per se, and this guy wanted to try me. And I put this thing out and it silenced <laughs> the whole <laughs> Long Island area, Queens or whatever for a long period of time. I'm like, I don't battle, I don't do that stuff. I don't have those abilities. But if you want, a, if you want a, a taste of what I can do, and, and later on in doing Public Enemy Number no. 1 was, was the thing that made Rick Rubin interested, interested in wanting to do a record with me mm -hmm. after I turned him down for a year and a half to two years. Um, wait, 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 you turned down a deal? Yeah, I didn't want to have a deal. I wanted, we wanted to be like the next BLS. We wanted to get a show on BLS and kiss. That was our utopian dream. We surrendered to get a deal. Wow, wow, wow. So that's what Public Enemy, like we did a demo called Public Enemy Number no. 1 when we finally conceded and surrendered to, to Rick. Right. Um, Hank Shockley, greatest daring producer of all time. He's, mm. he's, he's the, the Phil Spector of hip hop and all, <laughs> all the crazy comparisons, the wall of noise. He said, look, call the group Public Enemy. Bam, and then we start putting appendages of what it means. Public enemy, since the Constitution of the United States said black people was three-fifths of a human being. Right. And the public looks at it as being the sacred document that we must be the fucking enemy. Boom, boom. So it's easy to add the rhyme and reason to it right. once you have it there. Right, you know, right, So it right, didn't right, start right. with, you know, so logical things you can back up and add along the, along the line. But that's the simple matter of it. So it was understood worldwide because they worldwide it's a world of color of all kinds of human beings but in the united states they got stupid things like three-fifths of a human being uh, one percent of black blood i mean who i mean like they like it's the cooties so and we look at this document and we say you and, and black growing up with some sense of it's not like oh consciousness is this this big overblown word i'm conscious as opposed to being sleep and right. slurring so are you the, the the question is are you fucking kidding me with this bullshit all the way up to Donald Trump. We already knew in the 80s and the 70s that there's a lot of shit in the law in the country. It's, it's, it's so bull, full of bullshit, we just have to work our way around it because it is what it is. So that's where all that came out of. Wow, wow, wow. See, again. So, this, so you wilty or Bill today? Say it again? You wilty or Bill today? I'm Will. Will Chamberlain today. <laughs> I'm Bill Russell. Bill Russell, yes. We're old. We're the we're old, talking. curmudgeonly MC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nobody's good. Nobody's great. We were the best. Uh, the, the most fun uh, for me, kind of tapping into what you just talked the about. The most fun? The most fun for me. Wow. Uh, and, and That's saying a lot. You have a yeah, lot of fun. Yeah, you yeah, are, yeah. You I are mean, a man of fun in your life. <laughs> the most fun. And, and watching hip hop, uh, you know, because I, I go backwards, I go forward or whatever, I, I time travel. Uh, I remember vividly, like I said earlier, people talking about this music not lasting. To see Jay-Z and Dr. Dre basically close to being billionaires and seeing what's happening uh, economically is, is the, the biggest inside joke for me of all time. Watching you guys come, now that I know the radio backstory, it mm. makes it even more palatable for me. The irony is y'all didn't make radio records. The, the, in, in 1988, 89, when hip hop is kind of hitting what I call, consider the golden age, mm. the golden era stride, they had campaigns that said, we play no rap, 107.5. We play no, no, no rap, no, no rap, no rap, no rap. Like that was like a promotional thing. And I remember you guys 
going platinum mm -hmm. without radio play. Mm -hmm. It became this thing where uh, you set the tone for Brother J and X-Clan mm -hmm. and Poor Righteous Teachers and those groups that came behind you. Uh, but I think the turning point, in all honesty, was when Do the Right Thing, mm -hmm. Spike Lee's movie, you guys get the opening credit mm -hmm. for Fight the Power, and you do the video in Brooklyn. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'll just let you talk about what was the experience like in Brooklyn. And I have my feelings on mm -hmm. it, but I want to hear your side of what was that Do the Right Thing experience for you. It doesn't happen without Spike Lee. It's, you know... Just to make a long story short, and the short one shorter, Spike Lee was the portal that we never had. I mean, our first record that made a movie was actually The Tougher Than Leather by Run DMC. And I remember just bugging out, hearing like it was Terminator X to the Edge of Panic was in there during a scene where DMC has the headphones on. I'm like, wow. And we kind of like said, you know what? Radio's never gonna play us. What other portals can we, can we actually get our music into? Which holds true for us to this day that, yeah, we love radio, we're from radio, and matter of fact, we're competitive against what we call stupid radio. We want to destroy it. But um, when that happened, I think the next film that Spike did was School Days, and I think Kadeem Hardison was wearing a Public Enemy shirt. So that's <laughs> sight and sound in a whole different area where we was like saying, maybe we have to build these other areas. And then also, we would think by touring. Mm -hmm. Touring is, is also, because you're, you're with the best. So if you're competitive with the best and kind of like set a difference, everybody's not going to like you. Matter of fact, when you're brand new, your first two years, you ain't supposed to be the best. It's like, this is different today when somebody all of a sudden, like, who's this person? They're headlining. I'm like, who from where? It sounds <laughs> like an attache case to me. <laughs> but, uh, but back then, man, it was like one of these things that, 1989, Spike says, I got a movie. He came to us in 88, said, I need an anthem. The thing that made Fight the Power work and do the right thing was not that it was in do the right thing. Spike had it played a trillion times. I'm like, who does that? I mean, it's like, yeah. what? Matter of fact, when we delivered the unfinished version of Spike, because he had to get an unfinished version for timing, for when they had right. to, for syncing and everything up. So we had a version that was like nowhere near, but he needed it. So I went to go check it out in Brooklyn with Hank. And it was like, you're hearing the version that's the, like, like the crude version. And I kept sinking deeper in my sink. Oh man, oh man, he's putting it in that much? We better make this record hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what? And um, so yeah, that was the song in the movie. Right. And then when the movie first came out, it wasn't Public Enemy. It was like clips from the movie and Rosie Perez. Right. right. So it was help being distinct voices in it. Because people are like, oh, it's Public Enemy. Meaning that, yeah, we, we had a core um, following that expected, <clears throat> like, hard, unlistenable music. We were, we were cool with. But Fight the Power was a little bit, like, a little bit mainstream. It was funky. It was danceable. It was nice. It wasn't one of our <clears throat> records. That put an <laughs> ugly look on your face. Because yeah, you know, I always try to make records that my girlfriend wouldn't like. I said, if I'm making a record that she don't like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make a record to put a screw face on her face like, ugh. You know? So I'm into that. Fight the Power was one of those things like, it was like, okay, the family could sit around and enjoy and throw their fist in the air type of thing. But it was Spike. Spike put in the movie a, a, a million times. We had another video with the clip, and then when he shot the video of us getting together in Brooklyn, it was the third punch. It was like boom, 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 right. you know? And, Absolutely. And then you had unrest that was in Brooklyn, Absolutely. you know, the, the forgotten about hip hop county. Mm -hmm. Notice I said county, right? Mm -hmm. Or borough, because a lot of stuff started in Brooklyn. Right. But then hip hop as recording and in the late 70s was like Bronx and Uptown. And, uh, you know, and, and Uptown doesn't get this, the fair shake, although Uptown is where every, is the mecca of black ev culture and activity. So, obviously, you know, the Bronx, you know, in the 50s and 60s was considered the suburbs, you know, right. <laughs> the right. sticks. Yeah. Ain't nobody going to damn Bronx, they would say, you know. So, 
Brooklyn was the forgotten borough in the fact that Spike brought it all back into Brooklyn, shot the video. You had the unrest that was going down in Brooklyn and it was reported every day on WLIB. Mm -hmm. So this activity was already going down. And Spike made a thing ab about it in a movie that told the tale. And, um, you know, the rest is, is you know, I guess, as they say, um, our story. Flavor Flav. Oh! Just... How short do you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just expand. Ex explain. No, really, the simple thing came from, you know, how Flavor came along to be part of the concept to do records. I wasn't about doing any solo thing. But I was always, as Flavor worked on the radio station with us, mm -hmm. and already was his own personality. So I brought him along. I mean, we drove trucks together moving furniture with my dad which is a, a TV show in itself. <laughs> because you want to go back, you know how sometimes they say, let's go back into like, what? before they were public enemy, driving, moving furniture. Chuck D and Flavor Flav. And Flavor sometime and at the wheel. Furniture. And me in the, in the, yeah, Mr. TV producer right here, <laughs> movie. We driving around, yelling at people, playing Howard Stern all damn day. Wow. You know, and moving furniture. My dad, you know, you lifting an armoire in, into like a space, like, a two by four. It's like, hold it, hold it, man. Lift it, move. It. Man, you banging my fingers. That that type of stuff for like years. Gave wow. him his first job, man. So we would come up with things on the on the drive back in traffic in the in the U-Haul truck or whatever. And I said, well, we're gonna go to the studio because what we had was a you know production studio with the records in all Spectrum City. I said, I got this idea, man. I'm gonna do this thing. I want you to come in there as, and I lay it down. I just need you to cap the beginning and the end. Be like Bobby Bird and I'm James Brown. And that's how that thing started. It really started from Schooly D. Cause Schooly D had PSK and he had Gucci time. Mm -hmm. And he had his DJ Code Money open up in the beginning. Hey Schooly, why don't you rock one of them hard beats? And then Schooly comes in with the rhyme and then he also takes it out. So that whole technique, Flavor, I don't need you to do shit else. Open me up and get the fuck out the way, that type of thing, which <laughs> became public enemy number one. That's why Flavor says, yeah, man, that rhyme you was doing as we were right, going, right, taking right. the furniture from the, to, to your pop shop in L.A. Law to Queens, because that's where we had the storage spot to take the furniture and drop off before we go back to the crib. Wow. Yeah. And if you know anything about Flavor Flav's personality, that wasn't gonna last too long. <laughs> if you see Flavor of Love, you, you get it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, you know, when people were like, oh, I'm just so amazed at, at Flavor, I said, is he like that for real? I'm like, he is a thousand percent of that. He is the dude that will walk in the room and suck every bit of stardom. I don't care if Obama's in the room, he's gonna suck the stardom out of the room. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna stick to him, but he will suck it out of the room. You, you cannot, you cannot ignore him coming in the room. He's set. Now a lot of people come after Flavor, but they seem like they kind of calculated yes, their, yes. Their, their snatchings off of Flavor's Flavor. organic. He's organic. Uh, yeah, he is totally organic. It's like, and you know, and it, you know, it, it behooves me to try to figure out ways to to help him. Although you know, he's a grandfather of many kids and. He's older than me, but you know, it's like, if we do Public Enemy, it's my obligation to make sure that he at least kind of stay, keeps on the track of the track. It's like, it's the burden, the burden we have. <laughs> 1991, 92, 93, the next phase of Public Enemy in the 90s. Uh, the backlash and the breakdown with Griff mm -hmm. and the interview and the, you know, again, being associated with Farrakhan, which mm -hmm. again, one of my favorite rhymes of all time, mm -hmm. Farrakhan. Don't tell me that you understand, unless you know the man, favorite. Uh, expound on a little bit of what went down in that transition period with Griff and the, uh, the anti-Semitism thing that came up. Simple story. Um, our base is the UK, because mm. they write a story about your music, and they have a two or three or four pages. So that was a regular thing with Public Enemy. We got into the detail of a story and an issue. Here they had right on. And right on was the only thing that covered rap music. It's still a couple of pictures and teenagers would hang the pictures on the wall. And well, what about the music and a couple of sentences? And there was no music press whatsoever. Right. And, and these journalistic, you know, you know, okay, everything that, that 
that my man Bono, who's great people with me, or Bob Dylan says, is like holier than thou. But the black males, especially the ones in hip hop, not only am I not interested, but I can't even get my editor to print it. So we would make music and we had to be our what? Our own interpreters. Absolutely. So God forbid if they talk about anything of a higher level, such as, okay, what's the situation going on with Israel and Palestine? which had a conundrum since 1948. We would talk about it in, in the Melody Maker or NME, comprehensive, three or four pages. This conversation with Griff and, and uh, one of the magazines was really intensified talking about that situation in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. Who the fuck are these rappers to talk about this situation? Well, we're revered to do that. But once it echoed back into the just forming press of the United States, it turned into uh, a tit for tat in the Washington Times with a guy named David Mills and Professor Griff, who had things to do and Mills had things to do and, and I was supposed to handle the interview. I had something to do, gave it to Griff, two ticked off guys talking to each other. Both of them don't want to be there doing it. One guy disappointed I ain't there. Griff disappointed that he had to do it. It's an argument that turned in, it was an interview that turned into a, 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 an argument that got printed, that went off in all kinds of, went off the road. Wow. The aftermath of it was me not being able to handle what actually was said in the interview and what was done in the interview, but it was, the seed was just bringing the topic up anyway on how the Israel and Palestinian situation was one-sided. But that's done in London. Once you take it in New York and D.C. with a press that, really kind of looks at rap as still being a novelty and fuck what these black people or men got to say turned into something else. And that's just one of the casualties that this particularly happened at that time, dealing with a conversation at high level when most heads are at low levels. And, um, you know, when I said Farrakhan's a prophet I think you ought to listen to, you know, they were coming at Mr. Farrakhan because of his defense of Jesse Jackson, what he said in 1986 or 87 with Milton Coleman. So we were rappers that basically said, look, before this rap shit, put all this shit on music, whatever, you gotta treat us as black grown men in the United States of America. You gotta know where we're coming from. And yes, the air is human, and you don't wanna say anything bad about any, anything, but in an argument, in a fight or whatever, if things get printed to be exploitive, you know, that's, you know, Right. You, you know you're in a, in a word war. You're, you're in a philosophical war. So um, that f five year period from 92 to like six year period of 92 to 98, we did things like travel with, with you too. Bono recognized exactly and all the guys recognize, you know, where we come from and our point of view. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're from Ireland. Of course they damn near understand. Gotcha. We had to bring the United States of America up to understanding that through our portal of rap music and culture, you got to pay attention to how we feel, where we're coming from. We ain't doing it just to say, oh, yeah, yeah. We're, music we're musicians. We're culturalists. We travel around the world. We don't have a limited USA point of view. I've been 108 countries. So the minute somebody tells me about the world who ain't been no goddamn place, I'm quick to tell them or ask them, what the fuck are you talking about? You ain't been nowhere. You know, so this is this was our, you know, our yes, a little piss and vinegar in it, we cocky, mm -hmm. but I think um, the noisiest aspect of us was our skin. Hmm. You walk in there with this man, you making noise already. You could be silent. Mo, I wanted to ask you a question, man. What, when is when you re realize that as a solo MC, because we all all our eyes are looking at you. You as a solo MC would have to take on the world, and then you're going up against all these groups. I mean, it had to be like, because we were watching every step that you made, man. Hmm. For me, the transition, and I, I always pay attention to transitions. I think one of the things that's underestimated about our culture, especially uh, the artists in particular, is how observant and how intelligent many of us are. When I when I go to when we first started even doing this, I said, you know three of the four or five first people that I want to deal with would be yourself, Will Smith, uh, Kane, you know, guys that I, Dougie Fresh, because of the intelligence and the level of study that goes into this. We come from a group era, but as it was transitioning, 
and the music started changing and the sonic started changing and the success of Run DMC and going into the Walk This Way, uh, Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh and those guys or whatever, for me, I figured I had to come up with something to quote unquote, and we'll get into this word relevant in a minute too, uh, stay relevant in the new current style of music or whatever. So I literally changed my whole style. For those that know, I, I'm, I'm a, I pay attention to lyrics. Lyrics are pound for pound the most important part of hip hop for me from an MC standpoint. The DJs would argue it's break beats, but for us it's the MC, yeah. it's the, it's the uh, lyrical content. And I toned the content all the way down and did a record called Go See the Doctor because I had to come up with a way for the next generation to be able to relate. Because even if you look at hip hop today, which is gonna go right back to where, where I was gonna go with you, is I think Public Enemy not responsible, but part of the reason you see hip hop in the way it is today, uh, fast food, quick, quick, quick in and out, is because 1989 and 1991, Public Enemy, like I said, didn't get radio play. And from not getting radio play and still selling millions of records, it completely upset the apple cart. Because you could kind of predict who would sell what based on who got a, a certain amount of airplay, so to speak, or whatever. Mm. And you're completely obliterated that paradigm. My personal opinion, and many uh, experts in the industry know, that nothing on the radio at that time was on the radio without being paid for. Payola right. was very, very big business. Right. So for you guys to sell records without ever even being paid for, mm -hmm. got to a space where quite frankly, conservative, I use words like conservative as opposed to just black and white, conservative America got very, very intimidated by public enemies brand of hip hop. And we immediately went from we play no rap, no, no, no rap, to within two years, you're playing gangster rap and editing the profanity out. Somebody paid for that to happen. So we went from this so-called conscious space into the gangster space because it was like we'd rather deal with the lesser of two evils. If we're gonna have to deal with these artists and we're gonna make money on it, then let's kind of make money in them talking about killing each other. Right. As opposed to Elvis was a hero to most, but he never meant shit to me. Well, or more up. seriously, knowing <laughs> that you had, you possibly could have had wise, intelligent, for poor, righteous teacher or all the X-Clan coming up to your office and they really paid attention to those those, those rallies that were held in Brooklyn right. when X-Clan was shutting down the bridge, they were like, man, we don't want them up in our offices like that. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a point. What do you think the business side of the equation did to the art form? What makes, look, we're in the world of sports. Sports gets talked about. That's why this show is so important, this interview, these interviews are so important that you do. Because we're in a worldwide nation of sports where ESPN got how many channels? Five. Mm -hmm. Talking about the same damn game. They only last for an hour. How long can you talk about the damn game? <laughs> but rap music doesn't get talked about. It's just thrown at people. I, 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 we're, we're hurt by it. I think we're hurt by it as an art form, as a culture. Mm -hmm. I think our art form needs to be in school systems as a give me. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be automatic. Um, I think our culture and our art form is communication to the rest of the planet because the rest of the planet does it in their languages. We lack administrators and curators, and beware when curators and administrators come in who are not of the music, who are not of the people initially. I'm not saying the thing should be, okay, oh, it's gotta be black people from, from Harlem that figure in this somehow. I, mm -hmm. I just said that, you know, you don't have that voice, you don't have that neighborhood voice that figures in to knowing us as a people. I used to always ask this question, like, oh, do you love hip hop? Yeah, I love hip hop would be the reaction. Not even asking them questions, doing the, the Wilt and Bill Russell quiz <laughs> that we do. So do you love black people? Uh, what's that got to do with it? No, you love something that comes out of the people more than the people itself, and you don't figure out you know nothing about me. Or you think you know more about me than I know myself. That's the problem, that's slavery, man. And we, we because we're culturalists and we're, we're musicians, we best get this across to people how you should be able to honor this coming in. And the people that do this, whether they make a living off of it or mm -hmm. they begin to have an understanding of how the world works, you should honor that. And I just think it's been trampled. And now we're entering an era where it's not going to be trampled, it's going to be trumpled. <laughs> 
Uh, you see why I can't talk to him for 20 minutes ever. <laughs> <laughs> can't talk to you for 20 minutes. Get this guy started. We could go and go and go and go. I mean, um, and, and just building on what you just said, uh, and this still is part of the reason I'm doing this. What you just said kind of encapsulated it very simply. I, I just don't think that there's really enough in-depth conversation about what's going on. It's like, and I always said, pop culture is not culture. It's the most surface version of entertaining value in culture, right. entertainment value. So what you, what you have is a situation, again, what you just talked about, we, we, we're not really honoring or cherishing anything that comes out of it. We're literally, it's almost like the black exploitation movies yeah. from back in the days where you know that there's dollars there and you want the dollars, but you're not really willing to deal with what it is that they're going through or what's mm -hmm. happening. And I can't wait, quite frankly, to have uh, artists on, the Puffies, the Russells. Right. Uh, the, the biggest flaw, in my opinion, is uh, you have these guys that become somewhat entrepreneurs. They have the entrepreneurial spirit, which I do love. But we didn't teach each other the industry. We didn't teach each other how to, you know, you say, teach, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a night, but teach him how to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. We didn't teach ourselves publishing. And we, I learned all of that stuff after the fact, after the heat is gone, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. So part of the thing that I'm loving that you're doing with the internet radio and all of that stuff, which I want to throw to now in terms of your global connectivity and what you're doing from the art form or whatever, the, the main point I think that's missing is if we don't understand the business side of the equation, and yeah, the art form is one thing, the skill set is another thing, but literally understanding the nuts and bolts. The thing that happened to many groups back in the day is we all make a record, we're happy, mm -hmm. you go out, you get a royalty check that comes back, and then this one guy gets a bigger check than everybody, and everybody's mad because they don't understand. Well, he wrote the record. Right. That's why he gets the bigger check. Uh, now that the internet is here and hard copy is not a big thing anymore, what's the paradigm shift done in terms of where you see music at today, hip hop in particular? Number one, you gotta be a fan of it. And you gotta know the past, present, and future of all musics if you wanna be in the music industry. The problem is, is that, and one of the problems is that people say they love music but know less and less about it. This is the duties and the jobs that the DJs used to do on radio. Black DJs playing black music on black radio stations back in the day would tell you about a record. They would sell you a record talking about a record. They knew what the record was about. They just didn't throw it at people. We got into that era of more music, let's talk. And then that morphed into being a mechanical business deal that you paid the radio stations, they threw it out at people. And yes, rap music, you can do more music and less talk because in its beginnings, it had so much to say that it itself sold itself. When we spit or when we write and we see things out there, that's the thing that we do. I'm not a good businessman. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not brought in this world to be a good businessman. The only thing I have is the faith and trust of people that at least, if you love what I, what I love and you love what we do, then maybe your skill set area can lend to me and be a part of what I do. That's the most I ask for. Right. I'm not saying I could tell a person, oh, you should be a great businessman. That's like, I mean, if you're a great artist and curator, I'm not saying what you shouldn't be, but if you say this is what I want to do, I mean, why did Van Gogh, why would he have to be a great businessman? Or Michelangelo? The whole key as a community is that the thing that you're good at, I ain't good at. The thing I'm good at, you're good at. We have that trust. You know, uh, my publisher, Mike Kloster, I trust him as family. So he's great at that. Right. I'm great at what I do. We have to have a trust to work together. The trust was breached long, long ago in rap music and hip hop. Long ago. I mean, you, you cut your records with Bobby Robinson, mm. your first records. Mm. Made $436 in a paper bag. For there you him. go. <laughs> His trust was trying to keep up with that business and use whatever was, was, I mean, we had to eliminate that type of thought, and that thought ran through the 80s, to the 90s at higher stakes. It runs through the, the millennium at higher stakes. For a while, the speed bump was the internet. Like, you know what, you're not gonna come in the same old way, the same old way. We're gonna cut and put the, you know, pump them brakes on you. But also what happened in the later forms 
as we manifest it, they start throwing more weight behind the traditional areas. Like, we're going to make Drake go from Disney into this big star. Uh, and I'm like, I like, I like Drake, but I don't think the difference between Drake and Fabulous is like this. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm like, where did this come from? It, oh, well, he's in power areas. And, this, and still that somebody has a governing order over what the power area is over the rites of passage and the pecking order is a problem. Family dynamic. How do your daughters, especially the young one I'm really com- interested in, how do they respond to your music? Or are they aware even how, how much? Kind of weird. 28, 23, and 5. So my oldest daughters know that when I would take them to school, we ride around in my car. They listening to Motown, the Four Tops. They listen to stuff I listen to and my parents played for me. So they knew that when they were growing up, that's like, we get in daddy's truck. Hot 97 could be out there, but he ain't never playing it. <laughs> so they, and now it's tripped out because they listen to that music too. Sounds of the 60s and the 70s. I, I think the best period of music ever was the 60s and 70s. I, I, I think when all musics came together, cats recorded together, they performed together, and nobody ever slacked off, man. When you first came up, man, you were actually playing on bills with those cats out of the 60s and 70s. I remember. And they were looking at y'all like, and you know you had to come up with something to compete. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the saddest part of, of, of the trajectory for me in hip hop is those icons and greats that we looked up to, they really hated hip hop <laughs> at the beginning. So they wanted no parts of us. And then to get on those stages and, and do some of the stuff we did, uh, they were going through the same transition I think every generation goes through. Because I'm sure if you ask somebody that's 75 or something, they'll tell you the best music period was the 40s and 50s. Because your stamp is your stamp as you go. Um, but yeah, I, I remember getting on stage and blowing some of those guys out, quite frankly, not from an ego mm-hmm. standpoint, yeah. just from an excitement standpoint. It's very hard to get on after hip hop and do a love song. Very hard. Very hard. Um, uh, top five. Oh, sh- damn. <laughs> you can give a top five. Huh? And how favorite, long? Favorite five, and, period. And this genre has been out since 1979. And you know, and if I say cool mode, it sound like I'm patronizing, which I'm going to be. So you can't change that. (laughs) You know, Melly Mel, and you could attest to this, that if you want to talk about Wilt Chamberlain of it, Mm -hmm. Melly Mel was the the difference between the top guy and the second guy. This guy here is the second guy. Melly Mel is Wilt Chamberlain. So if Melly Mel (laughs) is like Wilt Chamberlain scoring 50 points a game, you average 35, right? (laughs) Right, right, right. <laughs> but at the same time, you admit right, that's Melly Mel. So you can't take Mel. And a lot of people that don't know history, it's easy to take it off the list because it was it was before them. But I'm like telling people every time you pull some money out your pocket, everybody on the dollar bills is before you too. Doesn't mean they ain't relevant in your pocket. You should right. know what the hell. Uh, but then again, they wouldn't know what a Hamilton is. All they know is ten dollars. <laughs> so when you talk about rap music and hip hop, you say Melly Mel. He's like, that's like George Washington on a one dollar bill. And if you don't know it, give me that dollar. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm keeping, you know, Modi out of this equation. All right. But you're the first one to come in and pretty much break it down into a lyrical explosion of. Focus devastation. Like you didn't want to get on Mo D's wrong side ever, because he would probably go back in the laboratory or have something <laughs> set up for you anyway. So that's the beginning of the audacity of a battle rapper. And today, battle rap seems to be on the tongue of cats who basically say that they kind of rap freestyle, which means that they have a save verse. So if you got a save verse, that means that you're trying to. Focus that in a battle. It doesn't mean you're freestyling. Uh, off, you know, uh, off the top of your head is different. So that's where it all came from. So you got to talk about where the core comes from. Then you talk about the evolution. I always thought that Jay Z, the evolution. I take the business and all that out of there, out of that equation. And Jay Z was the evolution of every all the parts that he saw before him to make, you know, him what 
he, he is and was, he was smart enough to do that. He was, right. It was like, you know, he saw the evolution of MCs and did a little bit here, a little bit there, whatever. Um, then, you know, of course, you, you got favorites like um, Scarface, who, who brought a whole different style. He's, the, to me, the greatest to ever, you know, emerge from the South, if you want to call it the South. And um, it's just dynamic. And then I, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Ice Cube and LL. And Ice T is the greatest, to me, the people talk about Slick Rick, the greatest storyteller ever, is, to me, is Ice T. So I end up, end up having a top 25 list. Gotcha. And I ain't on them. For you, uh, uh, tons of lyrics. I got tons of quotables or whatever. Oh, shit. Most profound, most entertaining, most poignant, whatever it is, favorite of your actual lyrics. Again, I, nigga, he, he's being humble. He didn't say it himself. For me, I always said that my favorite two MCs of all time, if you combine them, the perfect MC is Chuck D and Rakim. Because of the substance and the power in the voice and the masterful flow of Rakim or whatever. I always said if you could, and, and when I approach making music, I'm like, I need to be poignant, and I need to have the flow right. That's kind of the perfect MC. Your favorite lyric and what's behind it for you? Number one, I make tons of mistakes, and I kind of like live with my mistakes. One thing, when you hear Rakim, I heard Rakim do a live album. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's flawless. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could take his live album, it's like glass. Like he's live in front of an audience, and it's like glass hearing it. I mean, you hear all kinds of flubs and fuck ups. <laughs> <laughs> what, what the hell is that lyric? <laughs> but I, once again, being relevant to the story and to the lyric, your lyric and, and self destruction was the thing that that I was I was verklempt, man. I was like, <laughs> I said, how are you gonna have this much time and just nail it? It was like everybody should have went. Home, he just says, that one verse was a song. <laughs> Matter of fact, that one verse could be a song today. Just, just take, take that one verse, loop it three or four times, stretch it out. The, the, the Kumo D verse is the greatest verse of all time. Wow. And I was, and I'm not just saying it because I'm sitting at the show. It simply is. It explains past, present, and future. It's where we need to go. It's where it was a total reflection where we came from. And at that particular time when we needed it, nailed it. It's like everything before your verse in the song was a great setup. That was a knockout blow. By the time we came on, it was just smelling salts time. It was like, <laughs> yes, we urged the lures, and it was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this song could have ended a minute ago. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> could have put a door on it. <laughs> Shouldn't have to run for that black man. Boom. Mm -hmm. End of song. Mm -hmm. So we not gonna get yours, huh? <laughs> my, your favorite, your, your my favorite lyric. of your lyric. Um, or most poignant, or most stands out, whatever. I tell you, the craziest thing is that what I think is my favorite lyrical time and lyrical writing time, execution time. It doesn't get the credit for it because it's lost in the source of all the other stuff. But he got game. Yeah, I think He Got Game is probably the best song I've written and, and, the, and the best song that, that conveyed what I'm about. Wow. Yeah. He Got Game, it was a time in my life, I was 38. I had a good um, wealth of build up behind me and, and what it was all about and what I was, out, uh, what I was about to do and who I was speaking to and where we were coming from. And, um, you know, it was a good time. In 97, 98, 99, it's my best writing time, I think. Best writing, executing time. In closing, uh, I'll deal with this word that drives me crazy. We, we, we talked about it a little bit, uh, the word relevant. Um, it's kind of being defined now as current, popular, hot, people know about you, whatever, and they call that relevance. And there's a lot of people making irrelevant records that are hot and being termed relevant because of the heat. To me, the essence of relevance is definitely Public Enemy and Chuck D. 
have something to say, stands the test of time, it moves you, it's poignant, it makes you think and feel, even if you dislike, you don't necessarily love it or whatever, it still evokes feeling. I remember you said one time, a long time ago, uh, you know, if it's not extremely hot or extremely cold, then nobody's talking about the weather. It's just like another day. So yeah. that's kind of what relevance really is, and I think they define relevance. Chuck D, Public Enemy. Coming from the master teacher. Peace, bro, peace.